Dialogue with a Doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians, hosted by Dr. Gregory Leach and Jim York. Good evening, and welcome to Dialogue with a Doctor. Um, we're here this evening with my co-host, Jim York, and um, this show, as you, if you've seen it before, is where we interview local experts in their field, and we're privileged again to have Dr. Raymond Phillips back again tonight. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Phillips is a local practicing uh, gastroenterologist in Naples at the Gastroenterology Group in Naples. Welcome uh, back. Well, well, thanks. Thanks, well, Rick. Thanks welcome for having back. me. Dr. Phillips, just uh, give us a little background. I know our viewers probably heard it before, but uh, you have education and where you're from. And sure, certainly. Uh, the, uh, first off, I'm a board-certified gastroenterologist. And what that means is an individual who's you know, graduated from college. I went to Princeton University. I went through college on an ROTC scholarship th uh, through the Army. Uh, and then I went to medical school at Washington University in St. Louis. And then after uh, graduating from medical school, I did my internal medicine training for three years at Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. And then I was uh, selected to be chief resident for a fourth year. Uh, and then after uh, my residency training, I, I was, went on active duty in the Army, and I was assigned to a place called Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, where I was an internist for two years. And at that point, I was selected for gastroenterology training, and I did that training at Walter Reed for two years. And then after two years of uh, concluding my gastroenterology training, I was selected to be on staff at Walter Reed, uh, and I was there until 1991. And after, uh, after I concluded my obligation for uh, my Army obligation, I uh, came into private practice and I came down to Naples, Florida. And so I've been here ever since. And uh, we, you know, initially we have uh, an office in uh, downtown Naples on Goodlett Road and Colonial Square. Uh, but over the years we've expanded and we have a, an office in Benita as well as in Marco Island. And so there's uh, myself, Dr. Lebersky, Susan Lebersky, as well as a uh, uh, Dr. Neil Randall, and um, we have a new addition, you know, Dr. Mark, not Michael Marks, he joined us a number of years ago, and our newest addition is Dr. Uh, Gustavo Rivera. Uh, and uh, so we're all gastroenterologists, and, and what I've just described to you is the typical uh, overall training of a gastroenterologist, medical school, residency, and fellowship. So we're experts not only in the gastrointestinal system, but in liver disease, and in nutrition as well. And we've talked about topics in all of those areas in our previous sessions. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about um, C. difficile or Clostridium difficile, which is an infection that some of our viewers may have heard that word before because there's some concern that these infections can occur after antibiotic usage. And so now I'm seeing patients who are more educated in that regard. So, but we're still not as well educated as we would want to be on this, and things have changed over time. So I hear. So yeah, you're yes, tell yes, us about that. yes, indeed. There have been some big changes in this in this area. Uh, Clostridia difficile, uh, or the abbreviation C difficile, because it's a little easier to say that. Uh, it, it's been a bacterial infection that's been known about for about 30 years, and fairly rare occurrence in the past usually occurring uh, in the context of previous antibiotic use. That is to say, you, an individual would uh, receive antibiotics either in the hospital, uh, typically, uh, and then after concluding the antibiotics and uh, either in the hospital or potentially after discharge, a few weeks later, a month or two later, would come down with this infection. And it always seemed to agree uh, to be mysterious. Why was it occurring? And it sometimes would be confused with uh, diarrhea that might, or change in bowel habits that might occur in the context of using antibiotics. You know, almost all of us have used antibiotics at some point and have noticed when we take it that there might be some abdominal distress or bloating or irregularity in terms of frequency of movements. And um, typically, though, that resolves when the antibiotics are concluded. Uh, but what occurs with this particular infection is that in the context of receiving antibiotics, there's enough of a change in the normal environment of the bacteria within the colon, it provides an opportunity for this germ to be able to establish itself and to establish an infection. And that's, that's 
the framework in which you need to understand it. The, um, and we talked about this on a previous show, this concept, this, uh, this emerging concept that's now well established that the bacteria within our gastrointestinal system, we, we refer to it uh, collectively as the microbiome, a happy community of bacteria that are living in harmony with you and you're providing a home for the bacteria and they in turn are providing benefits to you. Um, but it's a, a vast ecosystem within your gastrointestinal system that we collectively refer to as the microbiome. Interestingly, one of its uh, peculiar properties is to protect you from infections. Uh, it is, it uh, actually have identified certain antibacterial uh, proteins produced by this uh, community within your colon that actually prevent infections from being established or, or being as severe as they would otherwise. And so uh, what our growing understanding is, is that as a consequence of the widespread use of antibiotics and also in the context of people being debilitated or having other conditions that sort of weaken their overall uh, status, uh, the typical circumstance of an antibiotic uh, making significant changes or depleting that microbiome and then providing an opportunity for this germ to establish itself. Now, as it turns out, it was a, a very mysterious, where did this infection live in the environment? Where, where does it occur? And it actually lives in, in the gastrointestinal system of people. One to two or three percent of the population will have this bacteria and, and doesn't really necessarily cause any kind of troubles. It remains sort of dormant, if you will. But given the right environment, particularly an environment where uh, the normal microbiome has been compromised, it can reactivate, develop new capability in terms of releasing toxins that can damage the gastrointestinal system. Um, so it, it's been quite a um, uh, history over the last 30 years as we've discovered with the widespread use of antibiotics, a higher and higher frequency each year or incidence each year of this infection occurring across the United States. Now, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, something changed. And, and it emerged out of Canada. A new version of Clostridia difficile uh, emerged, one that was much more capable in terms of producing toxins. It's called a hypervirulent strain which produces a thousand times more toxin than the usual variety of C. difficile. So this infection can rapidly uh, cause symptoms in terms of intense diarrhea, colon damage, and even death. So now that particular strain of C. difficile has swept across the United States, and now the, the prevalence of this infection is very, very high across the United States. So it occurs not just in inpatients any longer, but also outpatients. And what percentage of the population have this? Uh, About 3% will be carriers of this germ. But this, this particular germ, this particular bacteria, is e extraordinarily clever in terms of its capability of surviving. A and what it does is that when there's an active infection occurring, it releases a great number of spores, if you will, miniature eggs, microscopic eggs, that exist within the colon itself but also, as a result of the diarrhea, contaminate the environment in which the individual is living. Uh, so the consequence of that is their, uh, someone's bathroom or their home may have these spores, which when you flush the toilet, right. you, you get that nice flushing action, but it actually aerosolizes some of the material within the water and aerosolizes so the spores go into a little uh, tiny little droplet, spine droplets in the environment and spread out across the bathroom and potentially the home and uh, infecting all the, the surfaces. And so this spore can live pretty much indefinitely or exist indefinitely until an individual will touch it uh, and then uh, and er inevitably if you touch it with your hand, eventually your hand will reach your mouth and you'll contaminate your GI tract. And given the right environment, for example, if that spore reactivates and discovers a microbiome that's uh, compromised and not able to defend itself, it will start a new infection in that individual. So this, uh, this infection can occur again and again in the same individual, either through reinfection or through spores in their own GI tract reactivating. 
So it, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a uh, circumstance where more and more people are getting this infection, individuals who are coming to the hospital, the hospitals that can be potentially contaminated, uh, and then infecting other patients who have never had this before. So now hospital systems overall, particularly the hospitals uh, within Southwest Florida, are making a concerted systematic effort uh, to prevent this from infecting our, our uh, patients who come there for other conditions, or other conditions uh, that they, um, but in the con say for example, someone's admitted for pneumonia, they receive antibiotics, and, and then they have this, uh, they could potentially get this infection. That, that incidence of that, at least in the hospitals in Southwest Florida, uh, is much, much diminished, particularly Naples Community Hospital. They have recent statistics demonstrating a, a decrease over this last year compared to preceding years. So we're excited about that, but it's, it's still quite a problem, an, an epidemic, an ongoing epidemic, or 20 to 25,000 people a year are dying in the United States from this infection. I, I, I have a quick question. Uh -huh. um, so it is, I, I should risk to use the word normal resident of the intestinal tract in one to three percent of patients at baseline? That is correct, that's but, correct. So does it, does it serve a function? It's not really clear if it serves any function. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a free rider, if you will, that mm -hmm. is to say it, it exists but doesn't really necessarily um, uh, cause any kind of detriment or harm to the host. The, um, but something changes at times when new genes are turned on within this infection that can potentially cause it to, to become pathogenic, to cause harm to the host. So is it, and I know you'll go on to talk about antibiotic usage, but prior to antibiotics, like let's just say prior to 1950, it was, did people have infections? Yeah, and this is the interesting thing. In years past, going back uh, over the last 100 years, it's been identified in other environments or other patients, but it typically, before the antibiotic age, or there were no antibiotics, but what was typically happening, it was occurring in individuals who were severely debilitated from some other causes, either newborns who had immune deficiencies, very elderly individuals who had a number of other uh, conditions that were compromising their overall immune system, and it was only in those environments where individuals getting intense episodes of diarrhea that were associated with this. So it was a fairly rare uh, event before the advent, before the widespread advent of antibiotics across the United States. Uh, but since the 1950s, the incidence has gradually increased each decade. Mm. Uh, and to the extent that now uh, it's, it's probably the most common bacterial infection in the United States a gastrointestinal bacterial infection in the United States. How about in other countries? It's not as, uh, not as prevalent, and it, it, it does um, mirror the antibiotic usage. In mm -hmm. Europe, it's, it's a frequent issue as well. Canada, as I right. mentioned before, it's, a, it's a, a common issue as well. But in other parts of the world, it's not quite as, as uh, frequent. Uh, certainly, they have their own issues, gastrointestinal issues in uh, developing parts of the world and that in terms of parasites and so forth that are much more common issues uh, uh, depending on the particular area or part of the United world you're talking about. So at any rate, the, um, uh, now you have this infection uh, that can occur and once it occurs, uh, as I said before, it wants to keep on living and, and it has found the way through production of spores. Uh, and what, it, what happens if you are successful in terms of eliminating it, there's about a 25% recurrence rate. And what that means is that you'll successfully treat it, and interestingly, you'll successfully treat it with another set of antibiotics we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then the, um, but after the conclusion of those antibiotics, perhaps because of spores in the gastrointestinal system, perhaps because of spores in this individual's home, they become reinfected. And this is the part that's really uh, uh, discouraging. Once you get reinfected with this, the chance of another infection goes up to 40%. And then if you get reinfected for a third, uh, for a third time, the chance goes up to 60 or 70%. So there have been individuals who have had this infection repeatedly over the course of years. And each time it, it's a significant uh, infection. Uh, to the extent that it's debilitating, you can't function, you can't work, you have to stay home, and uh, it does require significant effort to get rid of it well, each time. This is, this is somewhat discouraging, 
<laughs> we're going to have to take a break. So oh, there's we, hope. Yeah, there's hope. We, yeah, need, to, we, we need to get encouraged uh, <laughs> after the break. So we're going to take a short break, and then we'll be back with Dr. Phillips to talk about uh, C. difficile. When picking a realtor, don't just pick anyone. Pick someone with experience. Pick someone with a proven track record. Pick a realtor like Jim York from Downing Fry Realty, the number one brokerage with the most real estate transactions in the area. My husband and I had very specific ideas about what we wanted in our new home. Jim York was able to help us find the home that was ideal for us. With over 20 years of real estate experience in Southwest Florida, Jim York has negotiated over $200 million in sales contracts. Selecting the right realtor is a critical decision that can earn you thousands when selling or save you thousands when buying. Jim also helped us with a mortgage lender and a good real estate attorney. He went that extra mile and his experience says it all. Call Jim York for a no-obligation meeting at 239-273-6727 or visit his website, www.NaplesYorkRealEstate.com. Welcome back after our short break to Dialogue with the Doctor. Uh, this evening we're speaking with Dr. Raymond Phillips. And um, as you already know he's a practicing gastroenterologist in Naples, Florida. And we're talking about uh, C. difficile, Clostridium difficile, which is a bacterial infection in the colon, somewhat, I guess, an opportunistic bacterial infection? Well, absolutely. It takes uh, advantage of the opportunity, an opportunity where uh, there's been an alteration in the normal microbiome of the, of the gastrointestinal uh, system, either through antibiotic use or, or uh, comorbid conditions where, for example, someone might have a number of other medical conditions where they're immune compromised. Now, uh, there are things that it, individuals can do to help protect themselves and, and help protect their family. Yeah, you know, good hand washing uh, af after going to the bathroom is, is particularly important. Using plain old soap and water is preferred because alcohol-based uh, gel foams, for example, don't kill the spore and antibacterial soaps don't kill the spore and don't necessarily uh, sweep away the oils and bacteria on your hand. So plain old soap and water is really the most effective therapy for prevention uh, after, uh, after going to the bathroom. Now if an individual has this infection, uh, then the surface of the bathroom should be wiped down uh, with, a, um, with, uh, with diluted bleach and that will kill the spore effectively. Uh, interesting a little story. Uh, is that the, how, how, how this can be spread through spores. Uh, there was a report from the, uh, the Centers for Disease Control about a group of Girl Scouts who became infected. And apparently their Girl Scout leader, uh, the mother, had stored the uh, Girl Scout cookies to be sold in packages in a corner of their bathroom. And someone in the family had an infection. Uh, the spores landed on the surface of these packages the Girl Scouts in turn went out and sold them and handled the packages and so forth. So a number of the Girl Scouts became infected as well as their customers. So, so the bathroom itself should be clean in terms of their surfaces uh, and you shouldn't store any food products in a bathroom either. Uh, and that, that sort of, uh, it makes sense after, uh, when you consider it. But there's other things that can be done and interestingly, uh, as a germ, as a bacteria, it will be killed off by certain antibiotics. And the ones that have been demonstrated to be effective is a drug called metronidazole or Flagyl. That's been around for 30 or 40 years. The trouble is in the last 10 years, the organism has developed a resistance uh, to this particular antibiotic. So 40% of C. difficile is resistant to this antibiotic. An alternative antibiotic uh, that has shown to be effective called vancomycin uh, has been available. Very, very effective, but very, very expensive. Uh, in a tablet form, it's $2,000 for a 14-day course. Uh, there's a liquid form that's much cheaper, a couple of hundred dollars, and that's effective. But um, it's, uh, suffice to say, more therapy needs to be available. In fact, we're participating in a research study right now looking at an alternative where it's a double-blind study where we're comparing vancomycin, which is very effective, to this new antibiotic. And so 
uh, was certainly we're, we're looking for individuals who have this infection uh, to recruit into the study. Um, so it can be treated, but the dilemma that we have is individuals who have a recurrence uh, of this infection. And this goes back to this issue uh, uh, as far as this issue about the microbiome that we talked about. The recurrence occurs because of compromise of the microbiome, and there have been studies now looking at potentially various probiotics to encourage uh, this regrouping, if you will, or uh, renewal uh, of the microbiome so that it can be an effective uh, uh, barrier for prevention of a recurrence. The, the difficulty is that in some individuals, the microbiome that a person has can be so compromised by previous antibiotic use, it can't be fully reconstituted even with probiotics. But it is worthwhile in general with the use of antibiotics to take a probiotic uh, uh, in concurrent with the antibiotic for a period of during the time of the antibiotic use and then for at least several weeks afterwards. Uh, in some studies, uh, there have been shown to be some degree of uh, effectiveness as far as prevention of recurrence. Probiotics, though, will not treat C. difficile. They are not effective for treating the infection, uh, and they will not do anything once the infection is established. Their major role is prevention of a new infection through promoting a, a reconstitution, if you will, of the microbiome. So that's how a probiotic works. Pro is that, did you mean? You said prevention of a new infection, prevention of a reinfection? A reinfection. That's prevention. Yeah, a that's exactly so. So, for example, if you have a C. difficile infection and you're treating it uh, with an antibiotic, uh, then a probiotic will prevent a reinfection. Alternatively, if you're given a course of antibiotics for an unrelated reason, say, for example, a strep infection or an earache or pneumonia, and you're concerned about getting C. difficile, it would be prudent to take a probiotic in addition to the antibiotic, and then for a period of two or three weeks after the antibiotic is concluded to, to help reconstitute your microbiome as a way of preventing C. difficile from establishing or developing a first-time infection with you. Now, the, the research on that is not quite as, as good, but there is some research. The trouble is probiotics, there's, there's, a, there's dozens and dozens of them out there, and it's hard to, to find one that, uh, uh, that really is effective. The ones that have been studied are, are the ones that you hear about most commonly in terms of Fluorstar, Activia, Align. They seem to have some effectiveness, but they've not, uh, none of them have been well studied. The area that's got us most excited here, and it relates to a concept we've talked about now a couple times and in previous shows, this microbiome, is that, as I mentioned before, some individuals will get recurrent infection with C. difficile. And after the second uh, reinfection, their chance becomes so high in terms of reinfection that they can get a reinfection again and again and again for years and years. And so desperate to treat these individuals, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, uh, there were a number of these individuals were treated with a stool transplantation as a way of reconstituting the microbiome, as a way of allowing these individuals to prevent another reinfection. And it's been shown to be extraordinarily effective for that particular purpose, for the prevention of a reinfection. It seems to be in, in uncontrolled studies, about 90, 95% effective as far as preventing a reinfection. So we've gotten extremely excited about that as, as far as using a stool transplantation. Now when I say a stool transplantation, we're talking about taking a stool from a normal individual without, uh, individual without any infection, without any gastrointestinal issues, and there's a number of different screening studies that we do to make sure they, don't, they in turn don't have any hidden infections that could be given to the recipient. And um, by, through a rigorous screening process, stool donors, volunteers are identified, uh, they're examined for any sign of infection, and then that stool specimen can be then delivered into a recipient during the course of a colonoscopy. And that would allow us to reconstitute uh, the recipient uh, the individual who receives the stool transplant reconstitute their normal micro, microbiome. Now, this was a um, 
becoming more and more common to treat recurrent C. difficile. And given the high cure rate, we were extraordinarily excited about it until last year, the spring of 2013, when the federal government said they were going to regulate stool. They were going to regulate stool because they regarded it as a drug and that it no longer could be used without uh, the proper application through the FDA with an investigational due drug license. Because what was occurring is it, it's increasingly realized that, uh, that the microbiome has a real powerful effect on a number of other medical conditions. Uh, and to give you a brief example, uh, and these studies were initially done in rodents and then replicated in humans. If you take the microbiome from a fat person and give it to a lean person, that lean person can gain weight. Alternatively, if you take a, a microbiome from a lean person and transplant that into a fat person, the fat person can lose weight. So the microbiome can actually influence the metabolism of an individual to alter their weight. And as you can imagine, pharmaceutical companies are extremely interested in this as a potential therapeutic uh, use for controlling weight. But also, it looks like it may be effective potentially in inflammatory bowel disease, potentially influence coronary artery disease, and a number of other conditions in terms of irritable bowel syndrome uh, and the common bloating and, and cramping and discomfort that people experience with the irritable bowel syndrome could potentially be treated with this as well. And, and but the thing that got the FDA's attention the most was the potential of individuals who have atherosclerotic disease, heart disease, those individual microbiome could have potentially, if transplanted to a recipient, uh, they could potentially give heart disease to a recipient. So it was because of those developing and emerging data that the Food and Drug Administration uh, has now decided that stool in the United States is a drug and will be regulated. And, uh, and that's, when that means regulation, it's an intense regulatory process. It takes years and years to undergo any studies. But the backlash from the gastroenterology community, because of this one effective use in C. difficile, and given the large number of people dying per year from it, the FDA made an exception for that particular condition to use stool transplantation for individuals who have had recurrent C. difficile infection. And indeed, we're actually doing that, uh, a stool transplantation program at Naples Community Hospital. And we've had uh, uh, two successes to this point. And we're certainly looking for more, uh, more individuals who may benefit from this. Well, I'll tell you, if, um, if I was told in medical school that you could transplant stool and cure coronary artery disease, I, I, that's hard to believe. Well, things change. <laughs> <laughs> things change. That's astounding. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank Dr. Raymond Phillips for coming this evening and talking to us about uh, Clostridium difficile and more. We've yeah. learned quite a bit. Thank right. you well, much. thanks so much for having me. I appreciate we, it. Thank we you. want you to come back. Oh, we will. We will. We have more exciting topics. with a doctor, featuring Southwest Florida's leading physicians, hosted by Dr. Gregory Leach and Jim York. They're looking at you. Welcome to Dialogue with a Doctor. We are welcoming back Dr. Raymond Phillips, who's a practicing gastroenterologist in Naples, Florida.